Frenzler, director of the Smithsonian Bicentennial Folklife Festival. If you enjoyed the festival, you'll be interested in this invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, an opportunity like this cannot be taken for granted. This evening, we are going to be beating our hearts out for you all, so I want to see people enjoying themselves. So get up and feel the music and do something about it, okay? This event is a right of cultural democracy. We have many, many partners, you included. I encourage you to stand alongside with us as we travel this journey year after year. Welcome to Barbecues Across Cultures with United Arab Immigrants, Matar Farm, and the DMV's Bark Barbecue, a part of Beyond the Mall from the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. Thank you for joining us. We are offering real-time captioning and American Sign Language interpretation for today's program. To view the simulated, the simulcast that includes these services, please use the link provided in the comments section. My name is Adrian Miller, and I am a James Beard award-winning author of a book about soul food, as well as another about African-American presidential chefs. I'm currently working on a book about the history of African-American barbecue titled Black Smoke. Today, we invite you to participate in a conversation that explores how sitting around a table or standing around a barbecue smoker can start a conversation. 
we, we will take some of your questions and comments in the live chat below. So please join us. The event is part of the Folklife Festival UAE program, which is supported by the UAE Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, the UAE Ministry of Culture and Knowledge Development and the UAE Embassy in Washington. If you don't know the festival, we encourage you to check out the website festival.si.edu to learn more. Now I'd like to welcome our guests, Hatta Matar of Matar Farm in Dubai, UAE, and Burj Grazarian of Bark Barbecue in Baltimore. Welcome, chefs. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Hi, Adrian. Good to see you. Uh, All right. Good. So let's start off with something that might get us into a little bit of controversy. And for the moment now, we'll say there are no wrong answers, even though there are some. But I will ask you, uh, start off with you, Hatam. How would you uh, define barbecue? Uh, barbecue for us is live fire. So charcoal, wood, um, whole animal pieces. Uh, and if you can, if you've got access to it, whole animal. Great. How about you, Burj? How would you define barbecue? I mean, it starts with fire, absolutely. And I think, uh, as Hatem described, it's you know either large cuts of meat or whole animals cooked indirectly for a long period of time at a low temperature. So right. I think that's what defines barbecue for us. All right, so I'm gonna follow up with you, Burj. Tell us how you got started in barbecue. How did this become a passion of yours? You know, it, I've always been um, intrigued by food, by cooking, my family cooks. Everything I've learned was from you know my mother and my father in the kitchen from a very young age. You know, growing up, what I thought was barbecue is, is, is what I consider grilling now. So, you know, being Armenian, I just remember, you know, my best memories were around the charcoal grill with the dads, with the uncles, with the aunts, and kind of that, that experience of cooking over live fire, you know, eating right off of the skewer. And, um, you know, and so I've always been intrigued by cooking over fire. And I think we did our, like most people do who enjoy this type of food, we did our pilgrimage to Austin, Texas about seven years ago. And um, it was my first time walking into a, a you know a barbecue restaurant and uh, into a pit room, and I think most of you, Adrian, you've been to those situations. Hot time, you've been there when you walk in, and I mean you've seen kind of the black walls from just the smoke that's been billowing in that building for decades, and the smells and the sounds. Um, I mean, I, it took me in right away. I was I was hooked, and um, I told my friends and I told my family. I said, when I get back home to D.C. The first thing I'm doing is trying to figure out how we do this. And, um, you know, so we, we bought a small offset cooker from probably Home Depot. And um, my first day I bought it, I didn't realize how long it's going to take to cook the meat. So I called my family in the morning. I said, guys, come over. We're cooking on the smoker. And I didn't realize when you buy a new smoker, you need to burn out all the kind of all the paint and all the smell. Yeah. And so they came over and I was excited, nervous. And uh, it was the worst brisket and the worst, you know, room ribs that we ever cooked um, slowly but surely did family events caterings um you know pop-ups at music festivals and uh now my, my whole family helps my wife leah my father boris my mom carmen my sister isabel um and and so we, we just try to learn every day and we've gotten larger smokers since then um but yeah that's how we got into it and, and what year did you get started uh, in 2013 2013 okay all right, how about you, Hatem? Uh, very similar to Burj, uh, a pilgrimage to Texas. I was there for work. Uh, in my other life, I'm uh, an oil and gas man. Uh, my first time I walked into the smokehouse, obviously very evocative with the smoke, but my, my hook was the first time I actually had brisket. I had it and I was like, what the heck is this and where has it been all my life? So obviously I'm in Dubai I don't have access to it. What I was actually doing, believe it or not, and you know, it's kind of embarrassing, but I was buying whole smoked brisket vacuum pack, freezing it and flying it back home. Um, so I was like, you know what? This is not sustainable. I can't keep making brisket. I can't keep flying brisket back, getting stopped by customs. What is in your bag? Do you not like chicken? All of these questions, everybody was giving me grief. So I bought a smoker just like Burge. I, I bought a, a Weber bullet. Um, and, you know, trying to get the fire right and uh, leaving it overnight, sleeping next to the fire. Um, I made a ton of horrible brisket. And then when we got it right, uh, we started having friends over. Their friends started bringing their friends. Uh, and then 
uh, we got people that we didn't even know showing up at the house. They're like, are you the barbecue guy? Are you the guy making brisket? Because there's nobody else that was doing it out here. Uh, and it kind of just grew from there. Okay. Could you give us a kind of breakdown of your customer base, like demographics? Do you have a lot of expat Americans? I'm just wondering who shows yeah. up at your spot. Yeah. No, it's a good question. So Dubai it has uh, an 80 to 75% expat community. So the local community is actually a minority. Um, and if you can believe it, there's 190 nationalities in the city. So um, we were the first people to get smoke billowing out of uh, any food establishment. So people were following their nose and it didn't matter where they were from. The common language was people would show up and be like, this smells like home. And I'd be like, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Jordan. Or where are you from? Oh, I'm from Texas. Uh, but everybody was following their nose. And even though it was the same fire and the same smell, you can imagine 190 nationalities saying, oh, this reminds me of home. Yeah. Did anybody say they're from my home state, Colorado? I'm just curious. No, nothing on Colorado yet, but I'll tell you when it happens. All right, cool. How about you, Burrs? Tell us a little bit about your customer base. I mean, our customer base is very local. Uh, you know, the D.C., Baltimore, you know, community DMV and um you know, typically what we like to do is, you know, I, I think the cooking experience with barbecues, it's it's always learning. Uh, and, and the best way you can learn is by collaborating. So we love collaborating with local chefs um, at their restaurants. But it's, it's you know, we've got obviously a very large Armenian community that supports us, uh, not just our, our, our family, but friends and, and cousins. Um, but, you know, word spread fairly quickly amongst our community. And, um, but we haven't done anything really outside of, uh, Baltimore or DC, except for again a couple restaurant collaborations in 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 the New England area um, and in New York. Um, it's a very small community here. Okay, so Hadam, we're going to look at one of your videos, and would you kind of describe what's going on in this video? We're going to play that. Sure. Now. All right. Sure. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, so while our wings are in the grill smoking, we're actually going to prepare the ingredients for our barbecue sauce. We like to make everything from scratch here at the Mokka Farm Residence. We don't actually like to say uh, farm to table, we say uh, barbecue to board. It's our no, first I'm, ingredient. I'm, I'm, I'm smoking! Our first ingredient, correct, our first ingredient is actually smoke. We've got tomatoes. This is going to be the base of our barbecue sauce. And we're going to add onions to caramelize at the bottom of the pan, the dates are gonna give us the flavor, the sweetness. You know, there isn't a, a right or wrong, so to speak, with barbecue sauce. The wings are already spiced, as you can see. Hannah's obviously very excited. We're gonna cover them in sauce and then put this in the barbecue to continue cooking for the rest of the time until they're done. All right, so yeah, if you could paint the scene for us. It looked like, yeah, tell what was going on in that video. Sure, so we were, we're the, the Motor Farm residence is where I call home. Um, my daughters were with me. They always like to cook. They're involved in everything except the fire and anything to do with knives. They're obviously the first taste testers. And we, obviously July 4th is coming up. Who doesn't like wings? You can have wings any which way. They're deep fried, they're boiled. Uh, and then people have hundreds of different sauce combinations uh, for their wings, You buffalo, you know, barbecue, teriyaki, garlic, parmesan, all of these things. So we made a barbecue sauce with local ingredients. And the local ingredient that we value the most and we use a lot in our cooking um, is dates. Uh, dates are prevailing all over the Middle East and North Africa, from Morocco all the way to Iraq. Some people will tell you Iraq has the best um, uh, dates. Some people will tell you that Iraq has the best dates. Um, and we use those to create a consistency and a sweetness that you wouldn't get with normal barbecue sauce. You know, normal barbecue sauce, you add ketchup, which is already sweet, right? And then you add brown sugar, or you add blackstrap molasses, or any of those things. The dates give it the sweetness and the consistency um, that you would normally get if you made what is called a simmer sauce. So we smoked the wings half cooked all the way up to 165, um, and then covered them in the sauce, and then smoked them for another 20 minutes so the smoke has an effect on the barbecue sauce. So it's actually smoked date barbecue sauce. Nice, nice. Sounds delicious. Yeah, Thanks. all right, let's, awesome. let's take a look at one of uh, Burge's video and then Burge as, as well afterwards, if you could just kind of paint the scene for us. That'd be sure. Great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Burge Kazarian. I'm from Bark Barbecue. 
what we're gonna do today is do a beautiful smoked lamb shoulder. You know, most of you know, we cook very classic Central Texas style barbecue. Uh, we're gonna change things up. We wanna show you guys a little bit about our past, our background. Liberally coat both sides with this spice rub that we created. And again, we want a lot of rub on this so it creates a beautiful bark. We're gonna leave these in here probably for about two to three hours without even looking at them, at which point we'll spritz them with some liquid, we'll give it some moisture. We'll cook it for several hours until we hit an internal temperature of about 205 degrees. At that point, we're gonna let it rest and then pull it apart um, for dinner tonight. Great, so Birds, what, what's going on there? You know, so it's it's obvious we, we cook brisket almost every cook and, and oftentimes we like to change things up. Um, you know, lamb is something that is in Armenian cuisine. It's in the Armenian diaspora kind of around the, around the world. We have a lot of Armenians in Syria, a lot of Armenians in Jordan, a lot of Armenians in Lebanon. Um, and so what we decided to do is come up with a recipe that uses a lot of fresh garlic uh, we love using garlic in our in our cooking. Even in our in our brisket recipe, we use a lot of fresh garlic. Uh, but then, besides the kind of salt and pepper that is quintessential for Texas barbecue, we added Aleppo pepper. Um, you know, there's a lot of coriander, um, and then we've got kind of a seven spice blend that's very common in Syria, um, and and that has nutmeg. It has some really beautiful um, uh, aromatic spices that we added to it, and then we treated it just like we would brisket uh, or 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 a you know. Uh, another big cut of meat, which is cooking it at between 250 and 275 degrees for a long period of time. Um, and then it just pulls apart. But what the way we enjoy that, um, instead of kind of the traditional way and pay slicing and, and order and enjoy barbecue, we kind of made these almost like these shawarma sandwiches. So what we did, you know, we had Armenian lavash, kind of thin bread, and then we put some garlic toom, some, you know, pickled cucumbers, fresh mint, some sumach and then the lamb, and then you just roll it up. You can eat hundreds of those. Uh, we enjoyed that for Father's Day just a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Will you invite you... me over? <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. And do you do you look, prefer cooking with the shoulder or do you like to cook with other cuts of, of lamb? Uh, I like the shoulder just because it has a lot of connective tissue. It has a lot of fat, which you need for that extensive period of cook. That way it renders out, it you know breaks apart. Leg of lamb is nice. Um, I just wouldn't cook it for as long because it doesn't have enough fat to to withstand that long of a cook. It'll dry out. Um, so I, I typically like shoulder cuts um, for longer cooks. All right. Well, if you're just joining us, thank you for this virtual gathering for the Folklife Festival from the Smithsonian. Uh, we're here at Barbecue Across Cultures. I'm here with Hata Matar of Matar Farm in Dubai, U I UAE, and then also Burj Grazarian of Bark Barbecue in Baltimore. Uh, if you have a question for either one of these barbecue chefs, you can uh, put it in the comments section and we'll try to get to your questions as soon as we can. Do you have one question I'd like to read? What kind of woods do each of you use? So Hadam, why don't you take that one first? Sure, um, you know, obviously we're here in the desert. Uh, it's hard for us to come by wood. So we import a lot of our wood, but there is wood that's grown locally called acacia. Uh, and acacia here actually produces honey. So there's acacia wood, it burns the same way as mesquite, but for us to have a neutral smoke, something that reminds everybody of home and we can actually use it across the board, white meat, dark meat, uh, red meat, uh, we actually use oak. Uh, and most of our oak obviously comes from, from Europe or North America because we're in the desert. So most of the stuff we use is oak. Gotcha, how about you, Burj? Same, I mean, we stick obviously to hardwoods. Um, that's what you need to cook good, clean barbecue. Um, and we want to keep it local. So in Maryland, we've got a lot of oak, um, which is what we use. Again, it's traditional, you know, for central Texas. Uh, we were lucky just a couple months ago when we went to go pick up our newest smoker from, uh, from Austin, you know, we, we had a big uh, trailer and we, we took advantage of it to fill it up with, uh, post oak, um, which is specific for that region. And it just burns extremely well. Uh, has a great kind of neutral taste and uh, it's not too hot and fast in terms like like mesquite. And so you can use um, an entire 10, 12, 14 hour cook uh, with oak without getting this kind of bitter um, tannic kind of uh, taste to your barbecue. So oak is what we use as well. 
All right, so we're looking at a picture of your smoker. Can you, it looks like it was custom made. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so this we were super lucky to come across uh, Sonny Moberg. That's the gentleman to my left there. Uh, one of the nicest guys you'll meet in the barbecue community. And he's in Dripping Springs. It's right outside of Austin. And he, he's just a, a craftsman. I mean, he knows how to weld extremely well. And he knows the engineering behind uh, a good cooker. Um, and so he built us a 500 gallon smoker about two years ago, which is half the size of what you see there. And, uh, we were good, you know, we, we couldn't uh, meet capacity with that. And so he, you know, he's got a, almost a two year waiting list for these cookers and he was kind enough to squeeze us in, in time for this one. So as you can see, it's an offset smoker. The, the firebox is to the left there. That's where all the fire is made. Um, and the meat is in that larger, uh, chamber, which is actually a decommissioned propane tank that's been repurposed. And so the fire burns kind of tumbles uh, and flows throughout the cooker. And then the exhaust or the smokestack is what pulls the, uh, pull, pulls the smoke out. Great. All right, let's delve, let's delve into some deeper questions about barbecue culture. So uh, one thing is, and this might get you all in a little bit of trouble, uh, should barbecue be sauced or not? So how do you oh, talk no. about the date? Yeah, you talked about oh, no. the sauce. And we actually have a chat question about that. So yeah, tell us a little bit about sauce for you, and is there a Dubai style sauce? So um, you can imagine uh, I learned uh, my smoking technique or I honed it in Texas, uh, a little town outside Houston called Bastrop. Obviously there it's salt and pepper and sauce is an afterthought, right? If, you're, if your salt and pepper rub on your brisket are good, and if you sauce it in front of the guy that smoked it, that's kind of a sign of, you know what, your brisket wasn't good enough. <laughs> so we've got a barbecue sauce. Our barbecue sauce is plum based. Um, and to answer the question about Dubai style, um, if you can imagine that Dubai was on the nexus of the Silk Route and all of the spices that traded there. So Indian cuisine is very prevalent here. So you have all of those spices. Our brisket and our sauces, we actually call them third culture cuisine. So it's Texas technique, but all of our spices, uh, they're my mother's spices. My partners are Syrian, uh, Sudanese, um, and we put all of our mother's ideas and cuisines into a rub and into our sauce. So uh, our our barbecue is actually, we call it third culture barbecue. Okay, I like that. What about you, Burj? What are, you, what are your thoughts on sauce? You know, to each their own. I'm I'm with Hatem on this. I mean, if someone has you know put in the time and, and you know, uh, cooked the meat properly and, and respected the meat properly, uh, it, there's no need for sauce. But let's not lie. I mean, we all love barbecue sauce. I mean, I think that's what attracted <laughs> us to you know, barbecue in general. So sauce is very important, but we always serve it on the side. And our yeah. sauce is, um, you know, our travels, my, my wife and I travel often and, and we usually travel because of food. I mean, we, you know, we love going to Mexico and we love kind of that Mexican mole um, that, that you see in, in, in a lot of their dishes. And so our sauce is actually based on that. So we do, you know, we kind of um, cook down uh, dehydrated uh, guajillo peppers, um, you know, and then we fold in a dark chocolate. Uh, we've got a lot of garlic, a lot of onion, and then a lot of dry spices that we cook um, without adding much liquid to it. And it makes this almost paste. And then we'll fold that into our ketchup based sauce uh, with a lot of black pepper, obviously, because, you know, we're playing, you know, we're also trying to be a little Texan. Okay. I'm curious because well, a trend in the United States is for a lot of restaurants to have different regional sauces. And then it has kind of a do-it-yourself vibe, right? You can just kind of customize it. Do you have one sauce in your restaurant, or or do you, or do you have regional variations on kind of your house sauce? We have we have one sauce, so it's our house sauce. But then, if we want to do kind of a special promote, you know, we're, we want to do a special cook. We do uh, sometimes we do more kind of Korean uh, inspired uh, cooking, and for that we might incorporate gochujang, or we might incorporate something into the sauce that will lend itself well for that cuisine. But, uh, you know, on a normal day or during a normal pop up, we'll have just our house sauce. OK. And do you have you ever thought either one of you, have you ever thought about having rotating sauces, like maybe mixing it up or you just going with what's good, what's proven? No, we I mean, have a, we have a house sauce like uh, we have a house sauce like Berg. Um, and exactly like you said, if we're cooking for a specific uh, diaspora, if it's Chinese New Year, if it's Diwali, um, if it's Nowruz for Iran, uh, and we're going to cater something like that, we, we switch up the barbecue sauce to include something that would remind people of home. The brisket is as is, uh, but we switch it up if we're catering to a specific community or a specific diaspora. Yeah, okay. 
Uh, so before we go to our next controversial question, we do have a, a few interesting one in the chats. If you, if either one of you are going to recommend just like a basic smoker for the novice who's just trying to get into the barbecue game, you know, Burge, what would you recommend? You know, the uh, the uh, Weber style bullet smoker that Hatem is very familiar with. That is kind of a great entryway to get in. It's it's a you know it's a vertical smoker. Um, it teaches you how to manage fire extremely well. Uh, but you can also use it as a grill if you wanted to. So I would say a Weber, or if you want to get more of a traditional offset smoker, uh, Oklahoma Joe makes a great smoker that's probably under 500 bucks that you could get at your you know local hardware store. Okay, I tell me, you are you agree or? Same, same. I got started on on a on a Weber smoker. It's actually still the smoker that we're using at at, uh, at the Mafar farm now. It's been six years. We lovingly named it Habiba, which means <laughs> beloved in Arabic. Um, we, she still keeps this company, she's still going strong and it's a great entryway and it's got a lot of real estate if you're just grilling or smoking at home. It's got a lot of space so you can do whole animal, you can do ribs, you can do brisket um, without having to invest in a giant piece of equipment. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's get to side dishes. We've talked about the meat, we've talked about the sauce. Now we need to talk about sides because that's part of the barbecue experience. So in African-American culture, you know, the side that's most debated, the one that you have, you leave to someone who has skills and who you trust is potato salad. So how to, <laughs> what, what's the one for you? What, what you, you know, when you're dishing up some barbecue, what's the one for you? We've got a, a, a potato salad that we, we, cause we make our own veal bacon. It's halal, it's kosher um, and potato salad that has, that kind of smokiness to it uh, always lends itself well. With the mayonnaise and the mustard and parsley, we've got chives on the top. So our potato salad uh, has our veal bacon in it, uh, mayonnaise, mustard, chives, a little bit of lemon, a little bit of vinegar, a little bit of sugar, but don't tell anybody. Um, and that's uh, and that's what we put right on the side of the brisket in the brown paper plates when we're at events. So now is your potato salad a large dice, smaller dice, or is it more towards the mashed potato vibe? Because I've no, seen it's, all types. There, it's, it's cubed up. It's cubed up. It's a mouthful. Okay. But lar is it large cubes or smaller? Yes, sir. Large, large? Okay. Yep. All right, Burge. Yeah, what about you? What's you know, I, I, let, side? I let my wife do most of the sides because she's better at that. But one thing that we always have on the menu is, uh, in Armenian, it's called garmir palaf, which it's, you know, it translates to red rice. And it's my grandmother's recipe. I don't dare make it. Um, she's taught my mom how to make it. Now my mom's teaching Leah, my wife, how to make it. So that's, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's basmati rice cooked in, um, tomatoes and we add some peppers, but something with a barbecue that's important and we all learn how to do better is uh, kind of the, um, the making sure that you're using all parts of that, of the meat. So when you're trimming brisket, you always have leftover, you know, parts, um, or trimmings. And we try to braise that and we incorporate that into the red rice. So uh, I call it grandma's red rice. Grandma's red rice. All right. Yep. Okay. Um, before we get to the next question, another from the chat. Um, can you give maybe one or two tips for the novice uh, or the home barbecuer who has limited outdoor space? Mm. You know, I mean, I, I, I tend not to recommend this this for most people who really want to get into BQ experimenting because a lot of it is about learning how to manage fire and, and manage heat. So I, I always try to opt for something where it's going to allow you to do that. But if you've got limited space and you really want to just have barbecue every once in a while, there are some good pellet smokers. Um, I know, you know, Traeger makes some pellet smokers that are compact. They're small. Um, you know, it probably wouldn't take more than three feet of space in your backyard. Again, if you can't buy a real wood smoker, that's the next big, best thing, unless you want to dig a hole in the ground and do it old school style. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Hato? Um, I'm kind of averse to the pellet smoker, actually. I'm, I was going to say almost blasphemy if you're using pellet smokers, but um, uh, Burge is right. If you don't have, if you don't have the space, um, the, the, the Weber team, the, the Weber people have a smaller version of the bullet smoker. And essentially, if you've got room to stand somewhere, it's the same size as a person. Um, but the, the, the trick is exactly like Bird said, barbecue is a question of tending fire. Um, and if you don't have this space or if you're smoking out your neighbors in a balcony or you don't have any place for the exhaust to go, I actually don't recommend that you try smoking in an enclosed space. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, we had some interesting photos pop up here. So I want to see one. I think there's one of Hatem. You're like, uh, it looks very uh, showman-like. You're lifting up the <laughs> lid. Yeah. Tell, tell us what's going on with that photo. I can't see it. Where is it? Oh, 
Okay, it's you in a brown apron. Can yeah. you see it now? Yeah. Can you see it now? No, just if you describe it to me, I'll tell you. Okay, you're in a brown apron, white shirt. You're lifting up a lid off a smoker. It does like a lot of, there's like a puff of smoke. It looks like some meat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember that. So yeah. uh, people were asking us uh, how do we manage fire and uh, when you adjust the vents, uh, how it increases airflow. Um, and when you close the vents, it actually turns the temperature down. And when you open the vents, it actually turns the temperature up. So uh, we were showing people that as soon as you open the lid, and the Weber bullet smoker gets access to air, it actually catches fire. So, and if you've got, if you've got smoke, that means your fire is out. If you close it, uh, sorry, if, yeah, if you close it, your fire is out and it builds smoke. If you open it, it actually turns to fire and you're grilling. So we were showing people the difference between airflow, no airflow to create smoke and a lot of airflow to create fire. Okay. And Burj, we had a very interesting photo of you. It looks like you're slicing some beautiful brisket. I don't think it's lamb, but uh, can you can you tell us about your brisket love? Yeah, there we go. That beautiful smoke ring. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so this is our brisket. I mean, simple. It's salt and pepper and a little bit of fresh garlic. Uh, it's smoked over oak for 14 hours, uh, plus or minus two hours, depending on what the weather's like outside and and how much that cut of brisket wants to cooperate with us. But yeah, so that's our most popular cut, and uh, we just slice it to order just like that, and people, you know, pay by pay by weight. Um, but we were talking about smoke rings and kind of terminology when it comes to barbecue. But I guess that's kind of your right to passage when you want to say I've I've smoked barbecue properly is when you see that proof on the uh, uh, on the inside of the on the brisket that that shows that you've actually smoked the brisket instead of cooking it uh, in a different method, and then. Oh, I'm sorry, God. No, you know, go ahead. I was just going to say, it looks like we have a shot here from your restaurant. Yeah, so this is a pop-up that we did. Uh, we don't have our own brick and mortar. Uh, we do kind of, we're a mobile kitchen and, and we'll do caterings and we do a lot of off-site type of events. This is uh, an amazing venue in Baltimore. And uh, this is kind of the line that we cut on, right? So there's the first thing is you get greeted by someone. They ask you what you'd like to order and you'll order by weight. And you'll see a scale right there in front of me and we'll slice the meat so that Kind of there's this transparency and and not only that it encourages people to order the right amount of barbecue and, and not be wasteful uh, and then the sides are right after that and this is all friends and family who are helping out you know they're, they're taking time off on their weekends and coming and helping us run the line and you can see here it's my my wife with me and my mom and my dad who are my biggest inspirations um and and we're kind of on an off-site music festival that we were catering gotcha okay great um, so the next question is kind of just kind of two questions. So if this idea of being a barbecue man or a barbecue woman in your community, and um, we have a lot of talk about this here in the U.S. Uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, there was a be beloved uh, community barbecuer named David McAtee who was killed during the protest. So the idea of a community barbecue person is on our mind. So it, the question is like, what does it mean to you to be a barbecue man in your community? And what, did, uh, what do your customers expect of you? So Adam, I'll give you first crack at that. Sure. Question. I mean, when, when, when we introduced barbecue to the UAE about five years ago, um, it, was the, it was the focal point for all of our get togethers. You don't uh, barbecue for one person, right? You never get the smoker going and put in all of that time and effort for one person. So what it means to be a barbecue man is you're the community linchpin. Everybody was coming over and you were getting everybody together. And it was the food that was bringing everybody together and then the company that kept everybody there after everybody was done. People, com complete strangers were interacting. Oh, hey, how did you hear about this? How did you do this? A barbecue man for me meant um, a responsibility and kind of a sense of belonging to everybody that we were bringing together. And would you agree with me that that's not a, that's not a self-appointed title? That's something you have to earn from the Oh my God, community? you know, we were walking in, 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 in the UAE we were walking different places and people would say, chef, chef, and I'm walking down the hall and, and I'm not answering. And I'm like, why is this chef not turning around or answering? And I turned around, I'm like, oh, are you talking to me? I'm, I'm not a chef, I'm a, bit, I'm a barbecue man, I'm a pit master. <laughs> there's, a, there's a distinction between the two. People are like, chef, I'm like, no, 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 please. And uh, because we were the first to do what we do, we got the, we got the, uh, we got the title on our own and, uh, and now we hold it very proudly. Nice, nice. How about you, Burj? What does it mean to be a barbecue man? To you. Yeah, I think it, it, it. I always tell people it's not extremely difficult to cook good barbecue at home. You know, you try it a few times, you're gonna fail a couple, and and at some point you're gonna cook amazing brisket, amazing ribs. 
the the concept of a pit master is someone who's capable and willing on doing that every day, day after day, um, being in a pit room that's you know 115 degrees and 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 doing a, a large scale of that and comfortable in that environment. But I think more than that is. Um, you know, barbecue is a, a community and transparency is extremely, you know, an important factor. A lot of the, all the recipes that I know have been passed on to me from people that I've spent time with, cooked with, um, or read about. And uh, when you hear about someone like that, Master McAtee pass away, it, it hurts because, you know, we're, we're a small community. We all were on social media. We share recipes together. We, um, you know, we talk to each other. We support each other. Even in the competition barbecue um, uh, industry, you know, you're sitting around people who are like-minded, who just enjoy cooking for loved ones. And it's very common to share your recipes um, because you know how much work it takes and dedication it takes to be a pit master, to do it day after day and on that scale. Um, so that, you know, that's what a pit master is for me. Yeah, David McAtee, rec uh, he just represented so much that is great about the African-American barbecue tradition. Um, you know, the skill at making it, his generosity. I mean, he, would give food to law enforcement, people who needed help. So uh, thank you for that moment. So uh, let's talk about kind of world uh, barbecue kind of influences. So Hadam, you talked about this third culture cuisine. So we have a question from uh, social media about uh, tradition. what's the tradition of kind of uh, meat smoking in the Arab world uh, and how does that inspire you? And so the, the Arab world, if you um, imagine uh, the geography of the Arab world, it's very arid. Um, there's not a lot of arable land unless you're on the Nile in Egypt. The rest of it, most of North Africa and the GCC, uh, the, the Gulf Cooperation countries, the Arabian Peninsula, is actually very dry. Uh, and the only thing they have access to is livestock, um, camels, goats, uh, not so much cows. Um, but the grilling and the barbecue that comes out of the Middle East is so varied and diverse. Um, they all have different names. And if you look at them in Iraq, they slow smoke uh, carp from the Tigris and Euphrates River. Um, it's a huge fish. You know what carp looks like. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful fish and it's called mazgouf. And it actually takes almost a day to get it ready because the fire is four feet away. The fish is split open, uh, placed on a spit that doesn't rotate. It just stays as is. And the fire takes forever to cook it. It's marinated in lemon and saffron and vinegar. And they don't touch it. They don't baste it in any way. So that's Iraqi mazgouf. In uh, the GCC, you can bury your food, and the barbecue technique is called matfoon, which is literally the Arabic word for buried. Um, and uh, the, the, the whole animal is wrapped in banana leaf, is wrapped in guava leaf, um, and then buried in a pit, and it's actually picked up the next day. So slow smoke barbecue, what you would call barbecue in, uh, in the USA, has a long tradition here because there's no equipment but there is the need to have uh, meat. And the only way to get uh, a whole animal cooked is to treat it nice and slow because of the fatty cuts. Um, so we've got a, a very varied tradition from country to country, but the common thread there is live fire. Gotcha. Hey, Burge, what about Armenia and what you're doing here and now in the US? Any, any thoughts on that? Oh, I think you're muted. You are still muted. All right. Well, while he's getting unmuted, uh, while he's getting unmuted, Hadam, I'll just ask you this question. You know, sure. one of we're just going to talk. Oh, Burj is with us. Go ahead, Burj. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we can. No. Yeah, we can. We can. No, no, we can hear you. We can Maybe hear you. Some tech can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to see if I can hear you guys because my headphones uh, stopped working for some reason. Over the day. Uh, the, the, I'm the sorry, just give the, me one the second. Of technology. <laughs> All right, well, while he's getting connected, let me just ask you about kind of trends. Um, what do you, right, uh, what, what are some of the hot trends? I know that uh, vegetables is really hot in the United States right now. So I'm wondering yeah. if that's, yeah, in your corner of the world, yeah. Look, we get, uh, like I said, the, the, the Dubai is such a, a welcoming city. It's such a melting pot of cultures that we've got a very large Indian community that is vegetarian. And they wait in line because they can smell the smoke. It's very evocative. Um, and they'll wait in line, not knowing what they're waiting in line for. They'll come to the front and they'll say, 
hey, can I get a vegetarian meal? And, and the first couple of times we didn't know, we didn't have vegetarian meals. So we actually started doing so uh, what lends itself well, just like fatty cuts of meat, what lends itself well to live fire uh, is root vegetables. So we had pumpkin, uh, we had sweet potato, we had beets, we had all of those things actually over live fire. Uh, and we offered the, a smoked root vegetable salad whenever we had pop-ups. So we didn't want to turn anybody away uh, or just give them a potato bun at the end of the day. So uh, vegetables definitely play into um, what we make and what we do. And it's actually, uh, I would say, it's a trickier learning curve um, because each vegetable is different. Uh, you're cooking several things at the same time. Brisket is brisket. But imagine cooking eight or ten different vegetables at the same time, trying to get all of them to be done, all of them to be crispy, all of them to be not soggy. So the learning curve for me on vegetables has actually been trickier than the meat. All right. Now, Adam, we have a picture of you, uh, I think, with your daughters. You're kind of outside. Okay. Yeah. Could, could you tell us what's going on in that picture? Uh, can you describe it to me? Yeah, you're outside. It looks like you're you're you have a dish in front of you. I think your two daughters on each side. Uh, nice yeah. kind of yeah. So we're the. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the the Mother Farm residence. We didn't actually create a brand and call it the Mother Farm. The Mother Farm is actually where I live. Um, so in the winter, when uh, the weather allows, we've got our own livestock. We've got our own fruits and vegetables. Um, and the girls and I are always outside Thursday, Friday. Our weekend is Friday, Saturday. So Thursday, they finish school, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We're just trying different things. And the kind of childhood that we had, kind of climbing trees and skateboarding and skinning your knees, I'm trying to get the girls to have an analog, non-digital life outside. And I'm doing that through, through barbecue. They got, a they got their chores in the morning. They got to go get the duck eggs. Um, they got to go get the fruits and vegetables that are ripe. And anytime we get a chance uh, for them to learn how to manage fire, we're outside by the barbecue. And, and their reward is always that they get to eat. Nice. Have you ever thought of a second career in parenting classes? That's the way to raise them. <laughs> yeah. <man. laughs> yeah. When I when I get it, I'll tell you if I got it right when they're 25 and then I'll start. <laughs> All right. Now we have another picture where we have, I think it's your mom and you're you're in the kitchen. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a couple of weeks ago um, during the lockdown. Uh, a lot of people were asking us to continue barbecuing and the heat was increasing. Um, and I said, you know what? I have to pay homage to my mom. She taught me how to cut my first onion and tomato. So we spent, uh, we did a live cooking session where my mom was actually cooking um, something and with her ingredients, but my technique. Um, and it was streamed live for the city. Uh, Dubai was, the, the whole city of Dubai was watching it. Um, and it was just me kind of paying homage to my mom and what she's done for me and, and, and how she's shown me, you know, to be brave in the kitchen. Uh, and we spent the afternoon, me, my mom and my daughters, cooking and hanging out with the city, but all virtually. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, I'm curious, how what is uh, jackfruit? That's very popular in the U.S. right now in barbecue circles. Hey, is that something you've tried to cook with? Uh, Adrian, you know, here, uh, food, food security and food supply is a big thing. Not a lot of stuff grows here locally. You know, there's, there's tomatoes. There's a lot of hydroponic farming. So uh, jackfruit is probably something that we import. And I know it's big in the barbecue community. They've got jackfruit jerky, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right? I, don't know. I have no comment about jackfruit jerky, but I must say uh, that we've, we've been experimenting a lot with stuff uh, for not for our customer base, but for everybody to kind of feel included. Uh, we made uh, mushroom jerky. Uh, we smoked portobello mushrooms uh, that are marinated. Uh, jackfruit we haven't tried yet, but obviously you know the process of smoke and how long it takes. You have to have something that will withstand the process and will withstand the heat and still come out edible. And when I mean edible, I mean texture-wise, flavor-wise, something that small, if you're having jackfruit and you're smoking it, it'll be acrid smoke and acrid tasting if it's absorbed that much smoke over the process. Great. Ah, oh, Burge is back with us. Can you hear yeah, Burge. All right. Oh, peace. All right. Just to, I'm going to give you several questions just to catch you up in the conversation. So first of all, it's just kind of you know, um, is there such a thing as Armenian barbecue, kind of these world traditions and how does that connect with what you're doing in Baltimore? You kind of talked about that a little bit, but, uh, and then uh, current trends, like what are you doing with vegetables yeah. in your barbecue? Yeah, there, there definitely, I mean, every culture has, you know, some sort of a bar barbecue or approach to barbecue. In Armenia, um, we have, you know, kind of these earth ovens that are dug underneath the ground, um, but it's very common in the Middle East to see similar, but. We've got this traditional uh, tunir, which is kind of a clay 
um, underground, almost like a big green egg if, for those of you that know uh, what that is, but it's essentially that underground and we cook um, chicken, we cook pork, we cook beef in that over an extended <laughs> period of time. But for us, you know, we, we try to stick to the traditional Central Texas style for all of our proteins. Um, you know, we, we absolutely love that and that's where our passion lies. I think we use our sides as an opportunity, kind of as a canvas for us to show where we're from, where we've been. Um, and so you see that in a lot of our sides. We do kind of from a vegetable standpoint, um, you know, ikra is, is kind of uh, popular in Armenian as well as Iranian kind of cuisine. And it's smoked, egg, I mean, it's, egg, it's an eggplant based dish, but we smoke the eggplant in the smoker and then puree that with um, onions and spices, um, cilantro or parsley, I'm sorry, and, um, and some fresh lemon and have that as a side. And we try to educate people uh, who come to get barbecue on where this kind of originates from, where our inspiration was from. But then we also have our you know, traditional mac and cheese and we've got uh, the coleslaw and everything that you need to do to, you know, to make sure you have a good barbecue experience. All right, and I think we have a picture here. There's a Washington Monument behind you. Can you tell us about this scene? This was one of the coolest experiences of my life. Um, we had the, the, the privilege of, of cooking for the Smithsonian at the Armenian Folklife Festival two years ago. And uh, you know, my dad was the one who really put it all together with the Folklife team. Uh, I was there really to help them out. And uh, you know, it wasn't smoking barbecue, but we were grilling traditional Armenian Khorovats right there in our nation's capital on the National Mall. It was, I mean, just talking about it gives me goosebumps. Um, it was it was an incredible experience. You know, we were feeding five, six, seven thousand people uh, a day. And so 4th of July, just tomorrow, two years ago, um, I mean, it was unbelievable. And just seeing the nation's capital right behind you, um, it, it really was a uh, uh, an experience of a lifetime. And now what cuts of meat are you cooking uh, there? Are those all lamb shoulders? That was all lamb chops. Lamb chops. lamb chops, yeah. Okay. Um, and are you doing much with jackfruit? We do. So um, we do offer a smoked jackfruit on our menu, uh, not for every event, but for whatever event we feel like it would fit the demographic. Uh, we offer that on our menu. And I think it's actually fantastic, especially if you top it off with some coleslaw and a kind of potato bun. Um, I enjoy eating it. Okay. So um, one thing we haven't talked about, which is prevalent in the U.S., is just cooking with pork. So, you know, like Hatem, where you are, um, I, I don't know, can, are you even allowed to cook with pork or is that part of your repertoire? Um, no, actually, we're, we're uh, thank you for asking. What we're actually doing uh, for the people that actually come and ask us, would well, you do smoked ham? Do you do glazed ham? Do you have pork, but do you have pork shoulder? What we're actually trying to do uh, is develop uh, halal, which is the equivalent to kosher, uh, we're trying to develop a whole menu uh, that is the halal version of what um, pork charcuterie and smoked pork would be. We've got veal bacon, uh, we've got pancetta, we've got porchetta, but all of it is beef based. Um, and you can't really cook pork unless you're at a hotel. Uh, they've got a pork, they've got a specific pork license. Uh, and what we're trying to do is offset that interest back into veal or beef or turkey or duck. We made it. We we make a, a smoked duck prosciutto. So all of the uh, the pork-based menu items that people would look for, we're reinventing the wheel and, and trying to bring them something that is halal and kosher and, and works here for the culture and the religion and the demographic. And Birch, how about you? Because I would think in Baltimore with a sizable African-American population, you, you probably have some pork dishes on your, your menu, but I'm just wondering how what, how's that part of your repertoire and what, what cuts? You know, we do a lot of pork shoulder. We'll do um, pork spare ribs and we'll sometimes do pork steaks, which is common in Texas. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Baltimore loves ribs, um, but we're a pit beef town. So bit beef is is kind of one of the most important um, cuts for us as well. Um, but, you know, we love cooking spare ribs for the community. It is one of our most popular items. Um, but one of my favorite things to cook is pork steaks, actually. Okay. So now tell us about the, first of all, can you just give a little bit more detail about pit beef? That's a regional specialty that I don't think a lot of people know about. Can you just say a little few more words about that? Yeah, we, we actually, we're trying to learn a little bit more about pit beef ourselves because we want to make sure that we're incorporating some Baltimore type of cooking. Uh, but pit beef um, is, is not a brisket. It's usually um, another larger cut of beef, um, whether that's the chuck or another uh, part of the cow that we, that they smoke, but then before service, kind of slice it and make sure it gets hot back right on the, on the grill. 
and then it's traditionally served with tiger sauce, which is kind of like a um, horseradish sauce. And uh, it's just something that's, it's classic in Baltimore. Um, we're trying to learn more about how to do it properly. I don't think we've gotten there just yet. Okay. And if we could put back up the picture of uh, Burge's smoker, it's just showing off the massive capacity of your smokers. So yeah. uh, you know, are, we, are we looking at briskets here? Yeah, we're looking at briskets on the left. That's kind of right when they get loaded on. When you close mm -hmm. the doors, you really don't want to see them again until you're done. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the picture on the right is probably about 10 or 11 hours after. And you can kind of see that mallard effect that uh, happens and you get this beautiful brown kind of mahogany bark on the outside. Um, and, uh, you know, in this particular case, it's, that's probably about 22 to 24 briskets um, that we smoke for an event. And so how many people are we saying uh, you could feed with that? Like how many people would you feed with a, a typical brisket? You know, you could feed way more than we than we do. I mean, uh, people when people will stand in line for barbecue. Uh, I can't blame them. They want to order a lot of brisket or a lot of meat. So it goes by fairly quickly. But you could probably easily fit feed 400 people with that. We usually sell out at about our, uh, our 200 customer. 200. Wow. OK. All right, so I got, I have to ask you, how long will you personally stand in line for a good barbecue? Um, at the most an hour. Okay, Hada, what about you? Um, we're kind of the only people that make barbecue, so I'm at the head of the line anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's great. Okay, um, then the last thing I wanna ask you, this will be a final question, is um, just the research pro uh, process, like how you learned about barbecue. I know a lot of this is kind of like trial and error. For me, I was reading old newspapers, magazines, cookbooks, anything I could find. So tell us how you schooled yourself on barbecue. That'll be our closeout question. I'll go hot, why don't you go first? Sure, um, I, it was trial and error for me, really. We, we, uh, it, was a hard, uh, it was a hard road of uh, trying to figure out airflow, trying to figure out cooking for 18 hours without standing over the grill or the smoker, Arab barbecue tradition, what we call barbecue in the Arab world is actually grilling, right? It's high heat. And you actually stand over the, the barbecue and you fan it, you close the lid and you check it, then you taste it. So for me to get out of the mindset, when I was in uh, Texas, Brian Bracewell, Carter, Robert, this is for you guys. Uh, I went down, we hung out, and I was so nervous when they actually gave me the smoker to manage for actual people. And it was my first time and I kept on checking on the brisket and I was opening the door and closing it. And Carter uh, looked at me and said, Hatem, what are you doing? And he said, Hatem, Southern draw. This is my Southern draw. I said, Hatem, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm checking the brisket. And he said, if you looking, you ain't cooking. And so I closed the door and I just, I sat with my arms closed and twiddled my thumbs and waited and waited and waited. And just the confidence to know that whatever you're doing, you know, if you make a mistake 18 hours later, you're not gonna be able to eat it. Just the confidence that you've set up the fire properly, you've spiced properly, you've tended everything properly, and you just gotta leave. And you gotta be confident in your setup, and then you gotta leave. So getting my confidence level up there, it was a lot of trial and error and a lot of reading. Yeah, makes sense. What about you, Burj? You know, it's trial and error for sure, but I, as I mentioned, the community is important. So I, I simply asked a lot of people who I went to their places and had good barbecue, and I asked them for advice. And typically it was just, Patience, right? Just keep doing it, keep doing it, and just stick to the basics. Um, meat itself is incredible, has great flavor. Uh, if you can season it uh, well and, and smoke it well, it's going to come out good. So, but we keep a, I keep a very um, detailed cook journal. So it's kind of like a diary, and it reads like a diary. And after every cook, whether it's for my family or for a pop up, I'll kind of wind down and uh, I'll crack open a beer and I'll sit down on my computer and I'll just kind of spill out everything that I did, good and bad. And oftentimes before my next cook, I'll read through that journal and it just reminds me of, you know, where I made improvements. So that's kind of my uh, recipe book, R&D book moving forward. But it, I wouldn't have been able to start that if it wasn't for people to give me good advice before getting into it. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. I feel we've bonded through <laughs> wood, smoke and meat. I definitely consider you brothers from another mother going like, forward. I Likewise. So thank you to our guest chefs, Hada Matar. And thank also you very much. Bavarian. Thank you so much. Uh, just real quick, any last thoughts you want to share that maybe we didn't uh, discover? We got a quick question about, is there something you want to try, a technique you want to maybe try going forward? So just real briefly, anything else you want to share? Uh, we're, we, uh, we, grilled, uh, we grilled a whole, we, sorry, we smoked a whole camel once uh, and it was extremely difficult. 
And uh, when we get access to another one, we'd like to try that one again. All right. What about you, Burj? Uh, we love things simple, uh, it's, uh, just like barbecue, that take a long period of time. So we want to start experimenting with incorporating some good bread, sourdough bread in our in our food. Uh, but we also are playing around with some fermentation of fruit. Again, it's just it's a matter of simple ingredients and time and see how we can use some of those fermented fruits in our sauces. All right. We'll just give you a second to each of you to sign off. Great. And thank you all for having me. Thank you to the Folk Life Festival. Hatem, Adrian, it was great uh, meeting you. All right, peace. Take care, guys. Right. So, well, I just want to say salam alaikum to everybody. Uh, and we say ahlan wa sahlan, which means welcome in Arabic. Anytime you guys are in Dubai, you have a home at the Matar Farm residence and a meal waiting for you anytime you stop in. Likewise. All thank right. you very much. All right. Thank you. Have well, a thanks to the, yeah. Thanks to the audience for participating, all those who watched, listened, and commented. We thank you. Uh, we want to thank our behind the scenes team, the All Stars, Elisa Huff, Sarah Rothman, Jenny Maycock. Diane Nutting, Alex Taggart, Michelle Bambling, Rebecca Fenton, Pablo Molinero Martinez, and Sabrina Lynn Motley for their production, promotion, and administrative efforts. We hope to see you back here for the next Beyond the Mall event. You can also follow the festival on Twitter and Instagram at Smithsonian Folklife, all one word. Or you can connect with me at Soul Food Scholar, one word, uh, all one word. Also at Bark Barbecue. Is that on Instagram and Twitter? Um, on Instagram. First, just Instagram. Instagram. Okay. And Madar Farm also on social media and to get updates as well. Now I urge you all to seek out and support your local barbecue spots. You can find lots of recommendations on my uh, Soul Food Scholar page as well as follow the work of these two gentlemen. Um, and I think you'll find get a lot of good finds. Um, also, uh, I know although we may not be able to come together in big gatherings right now, we can all cook food for our families, share some with a neighbor, and use what we have learned today to reflect on our cuisines and our communities. Eat well this weekend and take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Wonder, wonder.